My name is Jane Sorgold. I'm on the JDC board and a member of the Archives Committee. And I'm happy to welcome all of you to the JDC Archives' first annual Helen Cohen Memorial Lecture, which was endowed by both Jerry and Linda Spitzer in memory of Jerry's beloved aunt. Um, Jerry is the past chair of the JDC Archive Committee. And I'm going to ask him to come up and say a little bit about his aunt. Thanks, Jane. This will be <laughs> very short. Um, my aunt was the uh, one of five sisters. Four were born in Europe, and one was born in America. That was her. Who passed away pretty recently. She um, was single. She was somebody who um, was a professional in accounting, I would, I would call it. Always held a job of, uh, of importance. She was always interested in politics. I'm not going to tell you it's the right or the left side of it. But that, uh, that's another discussion. But anyway, she was really interested in politics. She loved Israel. She had gone there many times. When I returned from trips, from time to time, she would ask me what's going on overseas, etc. So when she passed on, Linda and I thought it would be good to set up um, a fund here which would allow this to really go in perpetuity. And we like to reach out to people who do research here uh, and of interest to JDC and, and something beyond JDC. So Jane, that's it. I don't know. Uh, thank you. OK. Thank you. So we're delighted that you're all here to share the lecture with us tonight. Jane, please speak to the mic. We're delighted that you're all here to share the lecture with us tonight. The JDC Archive houses the records of JDC since the, its creation over 103 years ago. It is one of the most important repositories in the world for modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars from around the world utilize our unique offerings for their research, as do publishers, uh, journalists, family researchers, curators, filmmakers, and others. Um, so I would now like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Rebecca Elblinger. Um, she's the author of The Rescue War, The Untold Story of American Efforts to Save Jews in Europe, which was published um, this past April. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Erblinger um, has worked as a historian, curator, and archive archivist at the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. for 15 years, and has served as a historian, historian for the museum's newest exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. She holds a PhD in American history from George Mason University. Dr. Rebecca Erblinger conducted research in the JDC archives for her PhD thesis and for the current book. And based on this research, Dr. Erblinger will be addressing us on the topic tonight of the US um, War Refugee Board and the JDC. The JDC played a central role in the establishment and, op um, and operation funding of the U.S. War Refugee Board. Thus, the topic of tonight's lecture is of great interest to JDC. Our format is that our speaker will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will entertain questions. Please. So much, and thank you to the JDC staff, to the Spitzers, and to the Archives Committee for inviting me. Um, it's a complete honor to, to be part of the first memorial lecture, and, and I'm really excited to be here um, and to share this really, I think, important and vital story of the cooperation between a non-governmental organization and a governmental one. Um, I think it's a, it's a story that has a lot of um, impact for today, or can have a lot of resonance for today. So. My story, or the story I'm going to tell you, starts on Sunday, May 14th, 1944. Uh, John Paley, the director of the War Refugee Board, who was 35 years old, he appeared on WEAF at noon. It was a radio um, broadcast, uh, an NBC affiliate. The station is now WNBC uh, today. So he's broadcasting out of Europe. The program is entitled On Freedom's Threshold. It's a half hour program in support of United Jewish Appeal. The narrator explains in the beginning of the program to listeners that the United Jewish Appeal is a fundraising initiative uh, to support the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the National Refugee Service, and the United Palestine Fund. Um, and it was, quote, 
the largest combined rescue effort ever undertaken by the Jewish of the United States on behalf of the victims of Hitlerism. Paley, uh, in his talk, gave a very strong pitch for donations to the UJA and by default the JDC. Um, he said, you see, the agencies of the United Jewish Appeal have a very distinguished record of achievement. We want to supplement and reinforce their activities. We want to cooperate them with them whenever it is appropriate. We hope that those who wish to further the program of the War Refugee Board will do it by responding generously to the campaigns of effective private agencies, such as those in the United Jewish Appeal. As President Roosevelt said, so this is Paley quoting FDR, through the UJA, the American people can make their contributions for the fight for decency, human dignity, and the freedom for all to live in peace. So this endorsement that Paley is making on national radio is a far cry from something that he had said just a year earlier, in June 1943. Um, at that point, he had denied the JDC uh, funding their request to send money to a partner organization in, in Italy. They didn't want to send a lot of money, but they made this request to the Treasury Department, and Paley had said no to that. Um, he said that it would be, and this is a quote, entirely inconsistent with this government, the US government's, present position on such matters. Current prohibitions against financial or commercial arrangements with enemy territory cannot be relaxed. So how does the United States government, and in fact the exact same US government official, go from denying humanitarian aid into Nazi territory to in endorsing the organization and actually fundraising for it um, publicly uh, just within the span of a year. There are two main changes. Uh, one is that the Allies start winning the war, and th this is an argument that, that you cannot understate. Uh, I do not want to minimize that. The anticipated Allied victory creates leverage. It creates leverage over the neutral nations, over the Axis powers, and it made the Allies much less cautious about humanitarian aid falling into enemy hands. Um, the second, though, is what I want to focus on tonight, which is the creation of the War Refugee Board and the partnership between the War Refugee Board and the JDC that saved tens of thousands of lives in the final 17 months of the war. So let me get into what the War Refugee Board was, because I think a lot of people don't have any kind of sense of them. Um, my book, Rescue Board, which, which came out in April, begins a year and a half uh, before this, in, in April, or I'm sorry, in August 1942, the first full weekend of August 1942, and it begins in the Les Miel internment camp in southern France. Um, many people, uh, it, it is not logical to think, um, and so most people don't know that there are Americans in southern France in 1942, after Pearl Harbor, um, watching deportations from southern France um, of foreign Jews north to Drancy, and, which is a camp outside of Paris, and then from Drancy to Auschwitz, uh, where most of them are killed upon arrival. 28-year-old um, Roswell McClelland, who went by Ross, uh, was a Quaker aid worker, and he worked in Les Niels, distributing relief, some of it, most of it, uh, paid for and provided by the JDC. And he is watching this first wave of deportations of Jews um, up north and then to Poland. Um, he knew in very vague terms where they were going. He um, had managed to get an audience with Pierre Laval, the, the president of collaborationist uh, Southern France, um, about a week earlier, and he had protested these de deportations. He said, and this is a quote from the time, that, that the Nazis are going to exterminate these people. And Laval had laughed at him. He said, it's a fiction, it's a rumor, and anyway, um, if the United States cares so much about the fate of the Jews, why aren't you taking them? That same weekend, uh, August 1942, is a pivotal weekend in, in Holocaust history, um, because Ross McClellan is not the only one working that weekend. Uh, Gerhard Rigner, the um, World Jewish Congress's representative in Switzerland, has just heard third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan to gather the Jews together in Eastern Europe and murder them. Um, this seems obvious to us now. We read Holocaust history with a lot of hindsight. And so we pick out events like book burning in 1933, and we say that, well, that's a Holocaust story. But that's because we know there's a genocide that will begin nine years later. And so we look for all of the different events early on that might have given us a hint that that was coming. If you're in 1933, though, you don't see that as a Holocaust story. You see that as a German story. 
And so the idea that in 1942 it would be a surprise to people that the Nazis are trying to murder the Jews, all of them, um, is something that, that seems obvious to us now, but was a surprise back then, or was something that, that Americans couldn't quite wrap their heads around. So Rigner gets this information. He tries to send it to the United States, to New York, to Stephen Wise, the head of the World Jewish Congress, um, through the US State Department. The State Department had a secure communications channel outside Switzerland. The State Department in Washington blocks the message from Wise. Um, they do not deliver it. Uh, they decide that it is a war rumor, that this information can't be true. Um, one calls it too fantastical. Um, the other says, another says, I can't see why they would put this thing in a telegram. And perhaps most um, interesting, one comments, even if it were true, there's nothing the United States could do about it. But the news of the Nazi extermination plan makes it out anyway. Um, and by November 1942 is front page news in the United States. And from then on, Americans know that the Nazis have this plan. Um, but there's a lot of debate and discussion over what the country should do about it, if they should do anything. Um, the War Department kind of had a consistent policy throughout this time that the way to save civilians, all civilians, Jews and non-Jews, is to win the war as soon as possible, to not divert any resources away from that um, and to, to just focus on winning the war. Many Americans did not agree with this. And throughout 1943, you see more and more public pressure on the US government to do something. Um, activists stage rallies and pageants uh, in the summer of 1943. They sell out Madison Square Garden twice in the same night um, with a pageant called We Will Never Die, a historical pageant memorializing the two million. Um, we now know that more than four million Jews had been killed by that point. But at the time, they believe it to be two million. Um, in October 1943, hundreds of Orthodox rabbis march on the U.S. Capitol. They present a petition to the Vice President, Henry Wallace, and they ask him to do something to try to save people. Uh, the JDC passes information through Switzerland to alert the Treasury Department to news of the deportations of Jewish children from France um, between the ages of 2 and 14 who are sent to Poland in 60 in a boxcar with no adult supervision. Um, this prompts the head of foreign funds control, uh, the, the Department of the U.S. Treasury Department, who, who is responsible for economic sanctions, uh, John Paley, the, the man who will go on the radio a year and a half or a year or so later. Um, it prompts him to revise his thinking about the JDC's requests to send humanitarian aid to Europe. He suddenly approves the request that he had denied a few months earlier, and he argues that we have now had sufficient experience in administrating our trading with the enemy controls to be able to permit certain well-defined groups like the JDC um, to conduct limited types of relief, of relief operations in enemy territory. So he approves the JDC's request to send money to Italy and also for them to send $100,000 a month um, to Switzerland for aid in Eastern Europe. And pressure, this pressure for rescue is mounting publicly, too. Um, in November, there's a bipartisan bill in Congress calling on Roosevelt to create a commission um, of military, of social workers, people to try to come up with ways to rescue people. Um, mass rescue at this point is impossible. The, the Allies have only a tenuous grasp on the European continent, um, and they're thousands of miles away from the death camps. But in 1943, more could have been done. Um, at this point in the story, the Treasury Department re-enters the picture. Um, they're all in their, uh, this group of Treasury Department lawyers that I write about, they're all in their 30s, um, and they had spent the fall of 1943 frustrated by the State Department delays in humanitarian aid. So even after the Treasury Department changes its mind and says we can allow groups like the JDC to send money, the Treasury Department, or the State Department keeps delaying the approval of these um, these bits of humanitarian aid. They also discover um, that not only has the State Department been delaying aid, that Assistant Secretary of State Breckenridge Long had personally instructed the US legation in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. The idea that Long had was if the American people don't know about what's going on, there won't be pressure on the US government to do anything about it. And so let's just stop the information. 
One of the best things about writing about the Treasury Department is that Henry Morgan Dow Jr., FDR's Treasury Secretary, um, the only Jewish cabinet member, he recorded all of his conversations as Treasury Secretary. So between 1934, when he becomes the secretary, until 1945, you can actually go and you can read all of his phone calls, all of his meetings. Um, you, can, you can read them like transcripts. Um, and at the end of December 1943, Josiah Boys, uh, a lawyer at Treasury, said, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that is willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what do we do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then another staff member, uh, Randolph Paul, the Treasury Department's general counsel, says, we are speaking as citizens now. So armed with their evidence about what Breckenridge Long has been doing and the State Department delays in approving humanitarian aid, the Treasury staff writes a new report, um, a government report entitled Report to the Secretary on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jews. Um, it begins, one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. Unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I am certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German-controlled Europe and that this government will have to share for all time responsibility for this extermination. So the Treasury Department wants to convince Morgan Thau and, and then FDR to remove anything related to refugees from the State Department and put it in the hands of a new agency. They create um, an executive order uh, calling on uh, Roosevelt to create a war refugee board, a new US agency dedicated to the relief and rescue of Jews and other persecuted minorities. But none of them, None of them in the Treasury Department have any experience in humanitarian aid, not any. So on January 11th, 1944, Moses Lovett leaves the JBC's offices um, at 270 Madison Avenue, just about five blocks from here. And he takes the train to Washington. Um, Paley's office is not glamorous. When Lovett showed up, he probably thought that he was not quite sure why he was here or why he was taking the time to meet with these Treasury Department lawyers. I don't know whether they told him what, what they were planning, um, but in any case, he goes. Uh, Paley's office is on the fifth floor of a building a few blocks from the Treasury Department above a furniture shop. Um, so it is not uh, any sort of auspicious place. Um, but Florence Hodel, who worked for Paley, kept a transcript of this meeting. Let's talk about the visa program, Paley began. And for the next 27 pages, Moses Levitt patiently explains US immigration law and practice to US government officials. Um, from how the quota system worked to the restrictions the State Department was enforcing in the name of national security. Um, and he included the JDC's June 1939 work on, um, on behalf of the passengers of the MS St. Louis. Uh, the Treasury Department is so unfamiliar with that story that the stenographer transcribes it as the San Luis. <laughs> Two weeks later, those same government officials are now in charge. Um, they are put in charge of a, a new official U.S. policy of relief and rescue. Um, on January 16, 1944, five days after they met with Lovett, um, Morgan Thau, Paley, Randolph Paul go to FDR. They present him with a new report now entitled Personal Report to the Secretary. Um, and he signs this new executive order, creating a war refugee board, a new government agency dedicated to the relief and rescue of Jews. Um, it is nominally headed by the Secretaries of War, State, and Treasury, but it's, it's absolutely housed at Treasury. Almost all of the staff are Treasury Department lawyers. John Paley, the assistant to the Secretary, is the WRB's director. Um, and so for the first time, the U.S. has a policy about the Holocaust in, in January 1944. The War Refugee Board tries so many different ideas and projects in, in different countries that it's hard to explain their work in any kind of pithy summary. So I'm going to give you some overall facts and tell you a few stories. Um, the same day that in January 1944 that Roosevelt issues this executive order, the staff streamlines the process that relief agencies were using to send money into Europe. 
So they now barely have to touch the State Department um, if the JDC made a request that they wanted to send money to a certain area, um, they could have it approved within a few days. Um, they argued that it no longer mattered if money fell into the hands of the enemy, that humanitarian aid was more important and it wasn't going to delay Allied victory. Um, by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board authorized more than $11 million, about $154 million today, to a host of different aid organizations. A majority of the money that the War Refugee Board authorizes for aid, about $8 million, or $96 million today, was approved for use by the JDC. Um, and at the request of the JDC. They use their licenses to send food to Jews in Shanghai, they support the Yugoslav Red Cross, relief in Albania, in Italy, in Sweden, in the Balkans. They pay for border crossings from France into Spain, and sometimes when they want more flexibility, they just tell the, the Treasury Department that they want to, their money generically listed as relief and rescue. Just kind of whatever we can do to relieve and rescue. Um, the War Refugee Board needs these aid agencies in order to do their work because, again, they have no expertise in how to do this. John Paley had never been to Europe, and so he is now in charge of, of relief efforts under the fog of war thousands of miles away. And so they need people who have experience with, with stuff on the ground. Um, so one of the first things that the War Refugee Board did after they were created is they surveyed all of these relief agencies who had um, underground channels or who had relief workers in neutral countries. Uh, the Quakers, Hyas, the World Jewish Congress, the Unitarians, almost all of these organizations are funded by the JDC. Um, and they get their advice on how to start. Uh, the JDC sends a four-page letter um, explaining their aid networks and their expertise in relief. Paul Bearwald, the JDC's chairman, said that they had dispersed $135 million in assistance since their creation. Um, and remember, this is early 20th century money, so this is $2 billion uh, today. And the JDC had personnel in wartime, Portugal, Spain, North Africa, Palestine, Turkey, Tehran. Um, they had cooperating committees in Switzerland and Sweden, um, and they were about to send people to London, Stockholm, and Cairo. Feel free to call upon us for such counsel and information as we are in a position to give, he said. We shall do our utmost to cooperate with you and with the members of the board in the great humanitarian task which the board has now undertaken. You have assumed a great responsibility. We shall want to do everything we can to be of service to you. The new War Refugee Board, needless to say, will take the JDC up on this because the agency, the War Refugee Board, also appoints representatives uh, in Turkey, Switzerland, Sweden, Portugal, North Africa, and eventually in London. Almost all of them Treasury Department staff members, though their representative in Turkey is a narcissistic Bloomingdale's marketing executive. <laughs> they leverage the near certain Allied victory that I talked about um, to put pressure on the neutral nations to allow more refugees over their borders, uh, to protest the Nazi treatment of Jews, and to provide the U.S. with intelligence of what's going on in neutral or in Nazi territory. From Washington, uh, John Paley, the WRB's director, lays out a strategy for the War Refugee Board uh, to convince the Nazis and, and perpetrators to stop the killing um, and to take action to rescue those who could be saved, either by moving people away from the borderlands into safety in neutral countries or allied territory, or keep people alive deep inside Nazi territory as long as possible, hopefully long enough to be liberated by the Allied armies. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example of each, and I will also say that most of these examples involve the JDC, and I did not look, need to look far to find them. Um, almost everything the War Refugee Board attempted was either inspired or aided by the JDC. The War Refugee Board launches a propaganda warfare campaign uh, using radio broadcasts and leaflets targeting would-be perpetrators, um, promising them that they would be brought to justice at the end of the war, that the U.S. would hold war crimes trials. On March 24th, FDR issued a statement drafted by the War Refugee Board that kind of mimics some of the language of the acquiescence report that the Treasury staff had written earlier. In one of the blackest crimes of all history, begun by the Nazis in the day of peace, and multiplied by them a hundred times in times of war. The wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. Only a few days earlier, Nazi Germany had invaded Hungary, and this presents a crisis for the War Refugee Board because the, first, the very first license, the very first permission that they give uh, after the board is created for people to send money into, um, into Nazi Europe is to 
assist Jews escaping from Poland to safety in Hungary. Uh, Hungary had the largest and last fairly intact Jewish population in Europe. About 800,000 Jews were living in relative safety in Hungary, and then in March 1944, the Nazis invade. Um, so the War Refugee Board adds a new paragraph to Roosevelt's statement. As a result of the events of the last few days, hundreds of thousands of Jews who, while living under persecution, have at least found a haven from death in Hungary and the Balkans, are now threatened with annihilation as Hitler's forces descend more heavily upon these lands. That these innocent people who have already survived a decade of Hitler's fury should perish on the very eve of triumph over the barbarism which their persecution symbolizes would be a major tragedy. One of the hard things about coming up with a, a kind of good summary of the success of the War Refugee Board is that you can't measure the effect of propaganda warfare. You can't say these people were saved because of an atrocity that was prevented from occurring. Um, but I did find uh, an interview an elderly German man who remembers receiving this leaflet. He found it in a potato field uh, as a teenager, and this is how he learned about the Holocaust. And he said that he believed um, what he wrote. So there is some evidence that these messages got to their intended recipients. Ira Hirschman, the War Refugee Board's representative in Turkey, is the Bloomingdale's marketing executive I mentioned earlier. Um, by the time he arrived in Turkey in mid-February 1944, no refugee ship had arrived in Istanbul in about two years. Um, not since December 1941 and the Struma an overcrowded boat of Jewish refugees, which the British would not allow into Palestine. And again, whenever I say Palestine, I mean pre-state Israel. Um, so the British won't let them in, and therefore the Turkish government would not allow them to land in, in Turkey. Um, after two months, the Turkish Navy tows the Struma out to the Black Sea, um, where it is quickly torpedoed by a Soviet submarine with one survivor um, and more than 800 casualties. After that, no boats made the trip, um, despite the fact that Romania and Bulgaria had large Jewish populations under constant threat, both from within their countries and, and in fear of a possible Nazi invasion. So Hirschman, for all his bravado, and if you read the book, he's, he's quite the hustler, um, he spent his first few weeks in Turkey trying to change this. <coughs> Stick with me here, because this will give you an idea of what everyone working in rescue, the, the War Refugee Board, the JDC, all of the other aid organizations, this is what they're up against. Um, in Istanbul, if you, if you want to get to Istanbul, um, in Istanbul, the Jewish agency's representative, Haim Barlas, is in charge of the legal permission for Jews to enter Palestine. Um, that's because of the White Paper, which was put in place by the British in 1939 and limited the number of Jews who could come over the next five years. So the white paper is set to expire in March 1944, um, but so few Jews are able to escape to Palestine during the war that there are still 31,000 unissued certificates left. Um, and Barlas wants to issue as many of them as possible as quickly as possible. So he compiles lists of names, dates of birth, and addresses, um, information he receives from representatives in Nazi territory. Um, this list then travels over thousands of miles. It goes to British authorities in Palestine for checking, to London, to the British passport office in Istanbul, to the Turkish foreign office, because they have to approve the security of anyone who's going to enter Turkey, the various ministries of the Turkish government, and then finally to consulates in Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. There's no internet, nothing is automated. All of this is going via cable and mail, checked, handwritten um, on desks, and so if, if somebody loses the paper, it gets delayed indefinitely. Um, the people who make it through all of these stages of approval then have permission to leave Bulgaria or Romania and enter Palestine um, if they can still be found three months later or four months later. So Hirschman negotiates with all of these groups, with the Turkish government, the, the British, the Jewish agency, even with diplomats from Bulgaria and Romania, because the War Refugee Board was authorized to meet with representatives of the enemy. Um, and by March, he thinks he has everything settled, um, but he still needs somebody to arrange the boats and to pay for them. These trips are not cheap. Um, the JDC paid for almost everything. For example, two ships, the Milka and the Maritza, made two trips each uh, from the port of Constanza in Romania to Istanbul, bringing a total of 1,074 passengers who could disembark in Istanbul, 
board trains to Syria, and then proceed to Palestine. The JDC pays $362,400 for the ship travel and $119,053 for the train transportation. So again, that's in 1944 money. So rescuing the equivalent of 1,072 people took the equivalent of $6.7 million today. Um, and it took weeks of US government negotiations and a lot of effort from the Jewish agency and the JDC to arrange the ships, the passengers, and their safe arrival and integration in Palestine. Overall, in 1944, more than 8,000 Romanian, Bulgarian, and, and Hungarian Jews escaped through Turkey to Palestine. Um, and that's thanks to the War Refugee Board's efforts and to the JDC's on the ground um, aid and financial support. The War Refugee Board sent a second representative to Turkey beginning in the summer of 1944 to help Ira Hirschman, Herbert Katsky, a former JDC aid worker who had shut down the joint offices in Paris um, when the Nazis invaded France, ran the joint offices in Lisbon for several years, and then joined the War Refugee Board's efforts. Um, Katsky ultimately worked for the JDC for about 40 years, from 1936 to 1979 with that brief window in which he works for the War Refugee Board. And then after his retirement, he, he worked for the, uh, the joint for another 20 years um, until his death in 1997. So I'm guessing some of you probably knew him. Um, in Switzerland, which was surrounded by Nazi territory, the War Refugee Board recruited Ross McClelland the Quaker aid worker that I mentioned earlier. Um, because Switzerland was completely surrounded, they, they couldn't send a representative to Switzerland. They had to find somebody who was there, and they end up recruiting McClelland. Um, among a myriad of other things, McClelland participates in ransom negotiations with the Nazis, uh, who try to use America's supposed newfound interest in the fate of the Jews to their advantage. They offer Jews for sale, which is the book, um, Yehud Bauer's book on this topic. Um, and many of the stories that I've told you about the JDC are about the JDC's funding of projects. So I want to reassure you in advance that, that the United States is never going to pay ransom. This is not a story in which the JDC is going to turn around and fund this sort of thing. Um, instead, McClelland and Sally Meyer, the joint representative in Switzerland, managed to string along a group of high-ranking Nazis for about six months with the idea that, that the United States might pay ransom. Please understand how brave you had to be to do this. Um, Meyer is a middle-aged lace manufacturer who had been the representative of Jewish communities in Switzerland and took on the, the role as the joint representative, not ever imagining that he would possibly be in this position. Um, he is responsible for the main negotiations. At the end of August 1944, he stepped onto a bridge um, between Switzerland and Nazi Germany because he very smartly refused to enter Nazi Germany. Um, and he met with SS officers, doing his best to seem reasonable, but to continue to have questions and concerns, continue to need to go back to the United States and ask them for things, um, anything he can do to delay the end of the discussion. In November 1944, Meyer even convinced Ross McClellan to secretly travel to Zurich um, to a hotel to meet SS Obersturmbachführer Karl Becker, um, or I'm sorry, Kurt Becker, who was in his SS uniform at the hotel uh, as proof that Roosevelt was personally interested in these negotiations. So during World War II, a government representative, U.S. government representative, and a JDC aid worker held a top secret, unauthorized meeting with an SS officer to negotiate on humanitarian grounds. Um, as a result, McClellan and Meyer got about 1,600 Jews out of Bernie Belson uh, as, a, as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis. Um, they also became very close friends. Um, McClellan would host Meyer for dinner. Um, McClellan's wife writes about how frantic she was to, to figure out how to cook a kosher meal. Um, and Meyer nicknamed McClellan Hanukkah. Um, probably for his skill in making small amounts of aid last as long as possible. Um, neither of them had seen any of their co-workers in years. Um, McClellan never met John Paley. There's no evidence that he ever met him. Um, and, but just like in the U.S., the JDC and the War Refugee Board worked very closely together in Switzerland. Beyond all of this, um, the War Refugee Board laundered money through Goodyear Tire to buy boats and guns in Sweden to rescue refugees from Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. 
um, trying not to let the Swedish government know that the U.S. is sponsoring unregulated refugee entry into their country. Um, they recruit Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman, and they send him to Budapest posing as a diplomat to assist um, Hungarian Jews. The JDC donates $100,000 to Wallenberg's work. Um, the war refugee board also sent 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. Um, if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package uh, from Buchenwald, Ravensbrück, Dachau, Mauthausen, it was almost certainly packed on Long Island, shipped across the ocean, um, and disguised as a Red Cross package. The JDC plays a role there too. Um, when the war refugee board is putting together their first batch of packages, their suppliers fall through uh, with only about 10 days to go. Macy's and Gimbel's, if you if you want the reference. Um, so when these when Macy's and Gimbel's falls through, the JDC helps the war refugee board find new suppliers in New York. Um, and they loan more than $40,000 to pay for that first set of packages because the board's funding from Roosevelt has not yet come through. The War Refugee Board opens a refugee camp in upstate New York. They bring about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees from Allied occupied Italy um, to live there, arguing that the Nazis must not be given the pretense of justification that the Allies, while speaking in horrified terms of the Nazi treatment of Jews, never once offered to receive these people. Um, they pass along requests from the War Department to bomb the rail lines, gas chambers, and crematorium in and around Auschwitz. And they give Americans, for the first time, detailed information about the process of arrival, selection, and gassing at Auschwitz. Um, in response to this information, which is front page news Thanksgiving weekend 1944, um, the Washington Post editorial board introduces Americans to the, the word genocide. Um, it's the first time that word appears in the American newspapers, and it's, respond, it's in response to the War Refugee Board's report on Auschwitz. There are many other stories, and like I said, most of them involve the JDC in some way. Um, the War Refugee Board shut down in September 1945. Truman wouldn't allow them to continue after the war, even though uh, they tried to make the case for him that, that there were lots of refugees still around, two million displaced persons, and that the War Refugee Board could play a role in trying to help them. Um, and a few months later, after the board shuts down, uh, the Treasury Department prints their final secret report, two volumes, um, detailing everything that the War Refugee Board had done, including the, the secret ransom negotiations. Um, Moses Lovett, the executive secretary of the JDC, uh, the man who taught them what to do, the only civilian uh, to receive a copy. In conclusion, um, the War Refugee Board's creation was and remains the only time in American history that the US government ever tried to do anything like this. Um, have a government agency dedicated to saving the lives of, our civil of civilians being murdered by a wartime enemy. Um, this 21 month period between January 1944 when the board is created and September 1945 is a moment when American action is actually matching our rhetoric about democratic values. Um, in contrast to subsequent human rights efforts, there's no secondary cynical motive on behalf of the U.S. government. There, there is no, this is not part of a larger program to gain overseas prestige or power. This is not a, a group that the U.S. government is particularly interested in for intelligence purposes or propaganda purposes. Um, the refugees in peril are not ever intended to become Americans. Most Americans do not want more Jews. Um, in this country. Historian Yehuda Bauer, who wrote, uh, obviously, the history of the JDC, also wrote, what made the WRB such a unique body is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. I feel like I should give the final word, though, to Herbert Katsky, the JDC worker turned war refugee board representative turned back to JDC worker. He gave an oral history to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum where I work in 1995. And he is talking about the JDC, um, but I argue that his words kind of reflect the war refugee board here, too. We had a job to do, he said. And there wasn't any question of weighing things. Can we do it or can't we do it? Do we have staff or don't we have staff? Do we need this or don't we need that? that? Whatever. You just dug in and did it. We surrounded ourselves with a group of can-do people, and they did. We had to do it. There was no choice. 
What had happened to the Jewish people in Europe was really so horrible. And if you think about it, it's incredible. You can't even talk about it. How do you kill millions of people just like that? And I think that stirred up a lot of the younger people and some of the older people too, who want to do something to try to not make amends because we didn't do it, but to try to do something to relieve the plight of the people involved just a little bit. And they were willing to put their time and their energies towards doing something about it. So if there's a summary to the story um, of everything I told you tonight, I think it's that when can-do people get together from the private and the government side, they can accomplish a lot, um, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And so I hope the partnership between the JDC and the War Refugee Board is something that can serve as an inspiration uh, today. We have microphones. Um, if anyone has a question, I think just raise your hand and, and they'll bring a microphone to you. I can keep talking indefinitely if anyone has questions. <laughs> I can tell a story. Hi. Hi. Um, my mother-in-law was a survivor and she always talked and she was in two camps and I think it was in Skarzusko where she said the JDC smuggled money in through, they had a representative in her camp, it was a guy named Efrat the Engineer. Did you ever hear of him? I have not heard of him, no. Okay. And then <laughs> they would distribute that. Each of those people would distribute the money. They choose five people in the camp who could be trusted, and they would choose like the neediest people and distribute the money that way. And she said it was completely a life. She was one of the people who was chosen to give money to people who were even worse off than she was. And she said it really saved people's lives. And yeah, the JDC had such a strong network, especially in Eastern Europe, that they then called upon when the war hit. Um, and it, that is one of the things that made them really different than a lot of other aid organizations who are trying to kind of build it um, in the late 1930s and early 1940s as people are getting shoved out of these territories. The JDC already has people in place and so they're able to figure out how to do things like that. And it, it really made an incredible difference in people's lives. Yeah, yeah, she loved joint and she hated the Red Cross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How, how did the Jewin raise all this money that they were able to raise? What were some of this? I mean, the United Jewish Appeal was a major fundraising effort. And they, they did use the War Refugee Board and, and the government to help fundraise. Um, the, the only real public speeches that John Paley, as director of the War Refugee Board, gives um, about his work are for the United Jewish Appeal or for the JDC directly. And the same thing with Henry Morgan now, he gives a speech um, just for the JDC. And so they, they have a strong network. Um, I think they have a long, a long track record with Jewish communities here in the US. Um, and they were able to publicize some of the things that they were doing. Um, I think a lot of people had memories of being helped by the JDC. And so they were then, once they came to the United States, uh, willing to donate their money because they knew that, that it would go somewhere. I understand that the um, War Refugee Board licensed, uh, provided licenses to JDC and others to be able to carry out the work that they wanted to do in Europe. Beyond that, the operating budget of the War Refugee Board, who funded that? Uh, Roosevelt funds what ends up being about $3 million. There's, there's a lot of debate in the scholarly community about the War Refugee Board's funding and whether they were over or underfunded. Um, nobody really argues they were overfunded. Um, <laughs> everyone argues if, whether or not they were underfunded. Um, if you go through the board's financial ledger, they return more than $600,000 to the federal government when they shut down. And they don't complain in any of the documents that I looked at about a lack of funding. But there's a big discussion once the War Refugee Board is created of how they will use their money, um, what they will do. And they actually meet with Paul Bayerwald and some of the staff of the JDC um, because they see, the War Refugee Board sees a couple of options 
Um, option one is to use the money that they get from Roosevelt, which ends up being about $3 million, um, to really kind of enhance the work of all of these agencies, to allow the joint to have the licenses that they need, um, to fund a few small projects, but to, to mainly use their efforts to provide kind of the, the ability for other organizations to use the money that they have been fundraising um, to get their projects done. The second is to, for the U.S. government, the war refugee were to launch their own fundraising campaign. Uh, the JDC was absolutely against that one. Um, they said that this would cause chaos in fundraising. If, if the United Jewish Appeal was raising money and the U.S. government was raising money for the same groups, they didn't want that. Um, and the third was to get an act of Congress passed that would fund the War Refugee Board, which they realized would take months and would probably not be very much money at all because Congress is still incredibly anti-immigrant at this point and anti-refugee. Um, and so they end up deciding that the board would have some projects of their own, like, like laundering money to get refugees from the, Balkan, uh, the Balkans into or I'm sorry, the Baltics into Sweden. That was a board-funded project. Um, but most of their effort would be spent trying to help other organizations who already had people on the ground, already was already raising money, um, to get them uh, to be able to do their important work. And so, so to act kind of as a conduit to cut red tape, to use the bureaucracy of the US government um, to enable them to do their projects. Um, when you mentioned Herb Katsky, I didn't, I didn't know what's in the archives. Linda knows what's in the archives, but I came in 1979 to the joint and I took Herb Katsky's place. And Herb Katsky left in 1979 and he just moved across the hall because we had a policy you couldn't work past 70 years of age. And I came in and worked under Herb and I learned whatever I learned. I remember saying to him at the time, I didn't come from this sector at all. This was my first job in this area. I came from a different life. And he said, you learn, you learn. And he stayed in New York and then I went overseas a lot to do a lot of the other things. So he is an icon, he really is, thank you. He also, he gave one of the best descriptions of, I think, the joint's work that I've ever heard. Um, he said that all other agencies did retail work. They focused on one type of, of refugee, you know, um, Catholic refugees or German refugees from this one area, and the joint did wholesale. Um, the joint was interested in everybody that they could help and to do as much aid as they could um, on, on the widest spectrum. And so I love that description. Uh, has your research gotten into uh, post-war Europe at all? Um, I'm speaking specifically like 45 to 49 in that era. The reason I'm asking, um, and I've done quite a bit of research here in the archives, um, my former husband who's passed away, um, evidently worked for the joint in the Paris office and was, um, among other things, evidently was involved with getting visas for stateless people to places like South America. Okay. Um, who funded that? I never thought about this before. Where did the money come from after 45, after the war was over? Um, my research has not gotten into that. I would assume it's still the United Jewish Appeal. Um, I'm looking at joint workers who are nodding at me. So I would assume that it's still from the American people um, through the United Jewish Appeal governmental or private? Private, yep, private, from the American Jewish community. Um, did your research, have you ever done any research on the relationship between JDC and the role of Adrian Fry in Vichy France? Um, there is a little bit of overlap between Varian Fry and the JDC. Um, I don't, in particular, nothing's jumping to mind, but I know that they know about him and he knows about them. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they had some of the same donors. Um, he did, Fry in the Emergency Rescue Committee did a lot of their fundraising in New York, and so it wouldn't surprise me at all if 
Paul Bearwald um, was involved in some of that too. Um, but he is, Fry is a little more, um, throws a little more caution to the wind, is a little more willing to break laws, and the JDC is not so much willing to break laws. Um, that is also one of the things that made the JDC really different, is that they, they proved to be great government partners because of their um, hesitancy in, in breaking laws. Um, they followed the rules, and they, um, they did not get in trouble with the, the French authorities, for example. The, and Barry and Fry, of course, gets kicked out of France. Um, so, uh, Becky, your work is obviously also a kind of intervention into this long, ongoing debate about what the United States could or could not have done in terms of rescue, and also what American jury uh, could or could not have or should have uh, done um, earlier, better, mm -hmm. uh, more more effectively. And I'm just. Uh, you know, so wondering, since this is probably not the first talk you've given on this uh, uh, topic, uh, so sort of how you're approaching that question. I mean, you know, as you write in the book, you know, the, it takes a long time for this board to get established. Mm -hmm. The motivation is there a lot earlier. The, the JEC is on the ground in these extraordinary ways that people can barely imagine. Uh, but in the end, the timing is kind of totally tragic, right? I mean, just at the moment at, at that the Hungarian Jews maybe could be uh, rescued. So it comes, in a sense, obviously very late. Uh, and uh, one of the questions I imagine you've been getting is, well, why did it take so long? And I mean, I'm just curious, you know, how you are responding to that question. And I think I know the answer, but I, yeah. I, I'm curious how you've been dealing with that question. I think um, when we talk about the Holocaust, we sometimes forget about World War II. And I think World War II is absolutely vital to answering that question, that it matters where the armies are. It matters um, that when Americans learn about the final solution in November 1942, the Allies have just landed on North Africa. Um, and that battle is not going well. Um, the, the invasion of North Africa exposes American weakness in battle. Um, when, when war broke out in September 1939, the U.S. had the 17th largest army in the world. We had spent the 1920s and 30s paring down our military uh, and claiming isolationism, saying we're never going to go to war again, we do not need this military, there's a whole debate. Um, in this period of American neutrality between the outbreak of war in Pearl Harbor, where Americans are debating whether or not we should ever go and get involved, even after France falls. And so I think the idea that rescue, mass rescue, um, was possible, especially after Pearl Harbor, um, I just don't think that's true. And immigration law had been set up since the 1920s to privilege Western and Northern Europeans. Um, and so for people in Eastern Europe, for Polish Jews, for Soviet Jews, who formed the majority of people who were murdered in the Holocaust, immigration to the United States was never a realistic option for them. By the time the Nazis take over their territory, they, they have, in some cases, very little notice of, of the invasion before the murders began. Um, and so it, it is this moment where I think what the U.S. government could have done to save the most people is to open immigration in the 1930s, uh, to open it wider, um, to, to say if you are fleeing persecution, if you feel yourself in danger, um, to make it easier for people to rejoin family, uh, not have them have to go through all of the financial hoops during the Great Depression to immigrate to the U.S. Um, that, again, is with hindsight. We know what will happen to them, and so we know that, that this is the population that we need to be paying attention to. Not Spaniards during the Civil War or Chinese during the, the Japanese invasion of China, though you can't get in at all if you're in Japan or China. Um, so it is this really hard question, and I think the board is created in 1944 because we're winning. Um, I think Roosevelt does not make that choice if it's not clear 
that the Allies are going to win the war. Um, and by and, and then rescue changes consistently and constantly throughout that next year. It, it matters where the armies are on D-Day as to what the War Refugee Board can do and so and what the JPC can do, um, where they can get packages, where they can get funding, where they can send things. All of it matters um, with the war. And so one of the things that I really tried to do in, in my dissertation and then in the book is to weave the war back into this story um, because it, it matters. And I think when we take the Holocaust out of that, it, it makes it seem like much more could have been done. And unfortunately, I'm not sure if that is necessarily true. So there's definitely, as you just articulated, uh, infinite moving pieces, moving parts to the equation here. But you mentioned that the War Refugee Board was really, and still today, I guess, really unique as the only of its kind type of partnership, I guess, if you will, that was formed. Other than codifying or the, the two volume um, catalog of mm -hmm. what, everything that had happened uh, that the board took on, was there anything in terms of best practices or anything that in terms of like after this ended and it was dismantled, did anybody come together to say, we just went through the 21 months of putting, you know, dealing with everything that came our way, but taking a, a second or a month or a year, whatever it was, to come together and reflect on the whole, everything that had happened and try to learn lessons maybe about ways that humanitarian efforts could then be that much more productive in the future? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I told the Treasury Department about this. They had, it is not, it is lost in Treasury history or has been lost in Treasury history until the past couple of years um, when they found out that I was working on this and then I explained to them that they had this history um, that they had completely forgotten about. Um, just like um, many Jewish survivors who survived the war and then focused for a while on building families, um, the representatives of the War Refugee Board become focused on the new world order, on the U.S. as a global superpower. Some of them join the IMF and um, focus on the new international financial system. Um, some go into private practice as lawyers. Some work with displaced persons like Kurt Katsky. Um, and so there's, there's always a new challenge for them, and they dedicate themselves to that new challenge. And so there really isn't a, a list of, rest, of best practices. Um, I hope that my book is the first book on this subject, um, the first non-self-published book on this subject in any case. And I, I think it's partly because the records for the agency are all um, basically in no apparent order. There's 120 boxes of them in no order. And so it took me two years to sort that through. And the other is because we have this memory of the U.S. as indifferent and anti-Semitic, this kind of unending narrative arc of American indifference and anti-Semitism, and we forget or, or send to like the afterword of a book on American anti-Semitism and indifference, like, oh yeah, and there was this war refugee board and they did some great stuff. Um, and I think it's really important that in 1943 and 44 that arc takes a curve and then suddenly we have this US policy. So I think there is there are things, lots of things that we could learn from them. Um, foremost among them that the US government does not know everything um, and that U.S. officials need to depend on NGOs who have expertise on the ground. And I think that is one of the pivotal stories that the War Refugee Board teaches, is that government agencies should not be afraid to survey NGOs and to utilize their expertise. Um, I think there, there is sometimes an idea that um, the government knows all, and they don't. There's a lot of, of great information and ideas in the private sector that the government could be using, especially um, with humanitarian work. And so I hope that um, this story will kind of get out there and, and inspire some people to resurrect some of the things that the board was doing, or at least look at some of the things the board was doing. Okay, thank you so much everyone for coming.